the moon is tidally locked to the earth, which means it always keeps the same face towards the earth. The earth is not tidally locked to the moon. The earth spins faster than the moon's orbit. But the moon is tidally locked to the earth. The only way you can get that kind of tidal locking is to have a circular orbit and lots of time. So apparently the moon has been in orbit around the earth for a very, very long time and has now become tidally locked. The moon is made of silicates. There's almost no iron. Now that's odd because the earth is mostly iron. That iron is in the core, but the percentage of iron on the earth is very high. The percentage of iron on the moon is very low. However, the isotope ratios of the silicates are almost identical, meaning that the silicates on the moon came from the same source as the silicates on the earth. Silicates, rocks. Hmm? So we have this funny dilemma. Where did the moon come from? It seems to be strongly related to the earth, and yet it has no iron. It has a circular orbit, which means it probably formed at the same time that the earth formed. And yet that orbit is in the plane of the solar system, which doesn't make any sense if the moon, if the moon formed when the earth formed. Where did the moon come from? How did we get it? When I was growing up, uh, our science class asked that question. It was in our science book. And they showed several pictures of possibilities. One of the possibilities was that the moon was captured, a body that had come in from somewhere else and got captured by the Earth. <coughs> this doesn't seem likely because the orbit is circular. A captured object would have a wildly elliptic orbit. You'd have to do something very weird to that object to get, get it to circularize. So the moon was almost certainly not captured. Another option was that the moon formed at the same time as the Earth. The two formed together. Okay, that kind of explains why the two have the same composition, but it doesn't explain why the moon orbits in the plane of the solar system unless something later changed the Earth. I don't know. Another possibility, and this is my favorite, is that the moon bubbled out of the Earth. <laughs> now, this is not as crazy as it sounds. Uh, let's say that the Earth was molten, because at one time it was, and let's say that it was spinning very fast, because at one time it was, and how does a body shed angular momentum? It splits in half. And separates. Uh, lots of things do this. So it's not at all infeasible that the moon bubbled out of the earth while the, two, while the whole system was uh, molten. But if that's the case, the moon should have the same angular momentum as the earth, but the earth's mang angular momentum is tipped. The moon should have the same composition as the earth, but it doesn't have any iron. My science book showed this beautiful picture of the Pacific Ocean with a picture of the moon superimposed above it. And the obvious implication was that this is where the moon bubbled out from the earth. This was before the science book recognized continental drift. Continental drift is a very new theory. It's younger than I am. <clears throat> where did the moon come from? Yeah. So, <laughs> the most recent hypothesis that most planetologists agree on is that about four billion years ago, just shortly after the Earth was formed, there was another planet, and that planet Sun, Earth, at 60 degrees, there is a point of gravitational stability. It's called the Lagrange point. 
uh, objects will collect there. We have them now. There are objects here in our orbit. There are objects here in our orbit. And Lagrange, what is it? Lagrange three and four, I think. Uh, it relatively stable. The idea was that the Earth formed another object formed roughly the size of Mars. Um, as it grew, the force here got a little too large. Uh, the Lagrange point is only somewhat stable. Once you start to violate the Lagrange point, then a motion gets set in effect, and the two converge. So about four billion years ago, an object the size of Mars plowed into the Earth, <laughs> melted it, if it wasn't already molten, the two iron cores merged. There was a splash. The splash was the low-density silicates forming a ring around the Earth, very close to the Earth. But dynamic modeling shows that the ring would last less than 10 years, that it would coalesce into a spherical body, uh, the moon. And now we get a, a, a dynamic system set in place where the Earth and the moon are very close, but there is coupling between the spinning of the Earth and the Moon, which we'll talk about a little later, which drives the Moon outwards and slows its rotation. That ends when the two are tidally locked. At this point, only the Moon is tidally locked, so the Moon is still being driven further and further away. At the time that this event took place, a day was five hours long, and the Moon filled the sky. Now the moon is very far away and a day is 24 hours long. In another 50 million years, the day will be 25 hours long. 50 million after that, it'll be 26 hours long. And the moon will continue to get smaller and smaller and smaller as it moves farther away. We are lucky uh, that we live accidentally at a time when the moon just fits on the surface of the disk so that we can see a total eclipse of the sun. Has anybody seen one? You been to see one? You been to see one? Yeah? You? A lot of you have. No, it was here. <laughs> it was here 30 years ago. Well, that's nice. <laughs> and good clear shot of it? Yeah. Huh? Uh, how long did it last? Yeah, three minutes. Yeah, three, four minutes. Um, most memorable three or four minutes of my life. Uh, was it? Uh, what year was that? 1999. I saw the one in 98 uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, any planets show up? This is, that's one of the things that astounded me. I, I should have expected it. But I was on the deck of a ship. Uh, it was a cruise ship. We were, we were going to the, through the Caribbean. We took this cruise in order to see the eclipse. Uh, and you know, at the moment of the eclipse, all of a sudden you see Jupiter and Saturn. It hadn't even occurred to me. And Mercury. It hadn't occurred to me that the planets would pop out. Uh, it was very cool. And the corona is this wispy, silvery thing, and that object in the sky just should not be there like that. Fascinating, uh, fascinating experience. Uh, you can imagine that it, it drove primitive... Uh, Humans insane. <laughs> I don't know what we were talking about before. <laughs> oh, yes, this. <clears throat> we were there, and I was trying to define components. I'll come back to components a little later when we talk about architecture. We don't see anything. Complain, we see complain, complain. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, now you do, right? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Actually, I did that wrong, but that's all right. Um, I was trying to explain components. I think I think I got the point across, although we'll talk about that much more when we talk about architecture later. Integration, uh, integration tests are multiple components, although still some things mocked out. System tests are the whole system put together, and these tests almost always go through the GUI, unless, of course, you don't have a GUI. The amount of testing done by system tests is pretty small. The coverage is 10%, maybe. 
You are not trying to test every business rule at this point. You're just trying to make sure that the system is glued together properly. So again, this is just plumbing testing. And then the last little bit up here is manual testing, uh, but a very particular kind. I don't want any of that scripted. I don't want anybody to hand a bunch of people a manual test plan. Wrong way, wrong way. There it is. It was the one right after. <laughs> the document you see here. Some of you heard this talk before. The document you see here is being held by a QA manager. Do we have, have any QA people in the room? Yeah? Okay. That's QA manager. Did I tell you this story before? Because I, I remember I did it, but it was at the talk I did two nights ago. This is the QA manager for a large internet travel company. He's holding a document here. This document is the table of contents oh. for his manual test plan. Um, oh, hey. Yeah. He has 80,000 manual tests <coughs> that he runs every six weeks. He ships it to a army of people in India. It costs him a million dollars every six weeks. He's holding it out to me because he's just come back from his boss's office, who has just come back from the CFO's office. The CFO said, what the hell is this million dollars every six weeks? You can't have that much money. You can have half a million. So he's holding this out to me saying, which half of these tests should I not run? <laughs> hey. <laughs> I told him, it doesn't matter. You can cut the document this way. This <laughs> you aren't going to know if half your tests work. Um, this is the inevitable result of manual testing. Manual testing grows. It must grow because your systems grow. And as the manual tests grow, they get more and more expensive to run. Eventually, they get so expensive that some financial guy looks at the balance sheet and says, what the hell is that? Then you lose the tests. The other way that you lose the tests is that they become so expensive and so time-consuming to run that the QA people start to shed them because they can't get them all done. And so then they start looking at the test saying, well, I don't need to run that one, I don't need to run that one, I don't need to run that one, because probably nothing changed there, and you lose the tests anyway. Manual tests, you lose, because they're expensive. Now, why did we write the manual tests? Because we thought they were cheap. Programmers are expensive. Testers are cheap. This is true-ish. Programmers generally have a higher salary than testers. On the other hand, programmers do things once. Testers do them over and over and over. So the cost builds up enormously. This is not rocket science. We should have known this all along, but we started <laughs> manual testing anyway. And all the programmers are perfectly happy because they didn't want to write these things. <laughs> so, whatever, you know, let them do that, fine. Um, it turns out to be a failing strategy. It's a failing strategy everybody has. The, the, the solution, of course, is to automate all of those tests. It is much cheaper to automate the tests than it is to execute them manually. It is more reliable to automate the tests because people will not judge the result. Oh, that test failed, but you know... <coughs> It didn't fail enough. <laughs> <laughs> it actually probably worked. It was just that guy over there downloading video. So it's okay. <laughs> you don't want that kind of stuff going on when you're running critical tests. So automated tests are more reliable. You're not going to lose them, probably. There are ways you can lose them. We'll talk about them later. Um, but at least you, you've got uh, much control over them. And, of course, automated tests are much, much cheaper. 
This is not automated. But it's also not scripted. These tests are called exploratory tests. Exploratory tests are when you hand the system to a bunch of experts and you tell those experts, break it. Break this system. Or better yet, another way of doing this is hand the system to a bunch of experts and ask the experts to tell you what the system does. Don't give them a requirements document. Just ask them to explore the system and tell you what the system does. It's remarkable what you'll find out, what the system does. There are experts in this discipline of exploratory testing. Uh, if you want to read some of their works, do a search for a guy named uh, James Bach. Very interesting fella. Don't go through an airport with him. <laughs> Ticket machines fail in his wake. Mm -hmm. He knows how to break into the mall and change them. He's got a whole set of disciplines he understands about how to uh, uh, disable systems. Uh, he likes to go into hotels and then call the manager over and say, there's something wrong with your machine. <laughs> <laughs> Look, look for this guy on the net. Um, gets a bunch of good ideas about what exploratory testing is all about. <clears throat> Anybody read the book? Um, this is a long, long time ago. A 1960s counterculture book. Uh, Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Okay, nobody knows that book. Good. James is the author's son. But that doesn't mean anything to you. And that's good. Question. Yes? Um, About Jonathan Livingston Seagull? No. no. <laughs> um, installation test. Installation test, yes. Where is this? That's one of the integration tests. Installation is a component to the system. And it's a way to install that system. So the integration scripts are one of the components. And you test that during this level. You can also test it here. In order to test it here, though, you have to mock out the entire system. So if you've got an installation script and you want to test it, you can have it install a bunch of dummies and start them up and they don't do anything. And that's fine. Usually, though, integration scripts interact with the system that they're installing. And, and so you'd have to be a little bit smarter about how you stub out the system. Uh, and then in the end, it's probably better to do that uh, here, where you've got some of the components active and some not. Of course, uh, you'd probably test installation here as well. A good system test begins with a raw installation. So you, you do detailed testing here and here. And then you do a, 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 a one-time test there just to install the system and do the system test. Um, throughput tests, um, performance testing, generally done here and here. You can do a little bit down here, but components by themselves usually don't have throughput problems. Throughput problems are usually based on interactions between components. So probably here and here. This triangle is composed this way because the vast majority of tests are down here. There are very few tests up here. The tests up here take a long time to run. The higher you go, the longer they take to run because the more the system is in place. At the system test level, you've got the whole database and all the web server and everything running. So you can't mock anything up here. So these tests take a long time to run. Fortunately, there aren't too many of them. So the total duration isn't very long. Down here, the tests run really fast, and that's a good thing because you've got to load them. You've got a lot of them. And that's the reason that, that it's shaped like this. We're trying to manage time. Unfortunately, most people don't have a pyramid. Most people have that. There's all the manual tests up here. 
<clears throat> few unit tests, few integration tests, and then we do all the testing. <laughs> it's not very efficient. People cost money, so we put them at the apex up here. And then, and then when we have to pay them, we pay them for expertise, not for their ability to behave like a robot. People don't behave like robots well. Has anybody um, ever looked at a manual test plan? And lived through the experience? Or stayed awake through the experience? Um, they can be very, very difficult reading because they're extremely dry documents. And then, has anybody ever executed one? This is living hell. <laughs> And, and can you imagine this being your job? Going to work every day knowing <laughs> that you were going to be doing it again? <laughs> That's not what humans are for. Oh, we were still doing first. Man, got to get through this first thing. Way the heck up here. Oh, there it is. Tip, 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 tip. Fast, and we're still on fast. <laughs> well. Of course, it takes a long time to get through this process fast. <laughs> it's one of the biggest problems we have. Uh, people uh, usually write tests in a way uh, that does not... They don't design their tests. They don't think about how to make their tests fast or well-designed or decoupled. They look at tests as a kind of side thing that you have to do uh, and you don't want to pay too much attention to it. I actually had a customer once who told his programmers, I want you to write good code, good, solid, clean code on the production system. Do anything you want on the tests. That was a problem because the tests got messy, of course and they couldn't be maintained, and they had to start throwing them away. One good way to lose your tests is to make a mess inside the tests. The more the messier the tests are, the less you understand them, the more coupled they are, the more they break, the more fragile they become, the more they cost mm -hmm. you, and then you start throwing them away. Make a mess in your tests, you'll throw them away. You throw the tests away, you start throwing the code away, because the code's going to rot on you. <laughs> so you don't mess around with the tests. You keep the tests very clean. You keep the test fast. If you don't keep them fast, you don't run the test. You don't run the test, you don't get the benefit out of the tests. It's a fast, clean, well-designed, part of the system. And that's really the issue here. The tests are part of the system. They are part of the product. They are no less important. They are not second-class citizens. They are part of the overall system, and you treat them that way. Okay. Did I cover everything about fast? Oh, uh, somebody asked me this earlier, and I, I might as well mention it. Has anybody run one of those cute little unit testing tools that uh, just keeps the unit test running all the time? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, which one do you use? Infinite test. Okay. Yeah, Infinite test. I tried Infinite test and JUnit Max. Both of them. Yeah. yeah. And how do they work? Both good. Yeah. But uh, if you have large uh, projects, then they get kind of stuck. That's what I have found with them as well. Um, Infinitest, I used, JUnit Max, I used, and I used them on fitness. And what I found was is the, the goal of these things is to uh, detect when you make a change. So they're looking at the, the dates on the source files. Uh, and when you make a change, they do a dependency analysis of all the modules that could be impacted. And then they run all the tests in the modules that are impacted. So the idea is, is that you don't have to run the entire test suite. It'll just figure out what test. This is cool, right? It'll just figure out what test to run. And in my experience, the what they figure out almost every time is that they have to run all the tests. <laughs> now, one of the reasons for that is, is that we are not very good at managing our dependencies, especially in the midst of developing. So our dependencies are such that the tool looks and says, well, it's everything. And later on, of course, we could refactor and prune that out and do it better. And the other reason for that is, is that the dependency analysis software uh, has to be very conservative. So if it even thinks there might be a chance, 
that there's a dependency, it will invoke those tests. So I found them to be, for large systems, not much better than just hitting the test button. For tiny little things, it's really cool. You know, do the stack with the infinite S. Green, 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 red, 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 green, green, green. Why you're typing, you know, why you're typing. <laughs> That's very cool. It, 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 it. <clears throat> if only we could make that work. Yeah. Uh, I use nfunch in .NET on an um, application with 45 uh, projects and uh, a lot of code. Yeah. And it works very well. Does it? This tool costs a lot of money too. $200. Oh, that's not a lot of money. Well, <laughs> if you say it's just a test runner to your pro uh, project manager, then it's a lot of money. Why would you say it's just a test runner? <laughs> 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 How much time do you believe the tool has saved you? Um, it saved me. What? How much time has it saved you? Um, my test saved me, but it saved me a lot of money uh, or time. Yes. How much time? How much time? How much time? Uh, I need for our project around five minutes to compile it completely. Okay. When when I do it on my machine and when I do it with Visual Studio, I have to compile it very often. And um, with mcrunch, I need to <coughs> execute the test maybe 20 seconds. 20 seconds versus 5 minutes. Yes. So that's a factor of 15. Yes. So you can execute your test 15 times more often using mcrunch. Now, I think you could make a pretty good case to your boss about $200. <laughs> Two hundred dollars. Yeah, you know, no, no problem. No problem. Uh, do you know what your hourly rate is? Yes, I cannot say it. Yet. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> so let me let me tell you. In the United States, a um, a programmer uh, will be paid about a hundred thousand dollars, depending on how senior he is or she. Um, a very sig a senior software developer might earn 150 uh, um, A senior lead might actually get up to $200,000. That would be that would be uncommon, but it does happen. Um, if we average all that out, figure that a, a software developer costs 120 grand um, salary. Then there's insurance payments that the company has to make. That's another Oh, 20,000. Uh, and there's taxes on top of that, which is another 10,000. And, and then there's the uh, space that the guy takes up, uh, the rental for his office, his laptop, training. Uh, you've got to pay the human resources people to coddle him when he's upset. Uh, so, uh, overall... <laughs> Overall, it costs about $200,000 to keep a year to keep a software developer. That's called the loaded rate. $200,000 a year is $100 an hour. So, I see the point. two and a half hours <laughs> pays for that thing. <laughs> Now, sometimes you get little managers that go, Do it in $50 is a lot of money. But. <laughs> <laughs> if we're going to get through this, we better get through it. The, um, <clears throat> the rest of it is erst. Isolate. Talk, uh, tests should be isolated, um, independent. You ought to be able to run them. Uh, one at a time. Any particular test you want to run, you want to be able to run. You don't want to have to run test one and then test two and then test three. You don't want them to depend upon each other. 
you don't want the C++ compile time problem, um, which I'm sure I talked to you about before. Uh, the number of errors you get completely mm -hmm. indeterminate. So we like to keep our tests utterly independent. This is true not just of unit tests, but of all tests. Uh, whether they are component level tests, integration level tests, system tests, we want them to be independent. I can run them isolated, one at a time. Repeatable. I should be able to run my tests at 30,000 feet over the Atlantic. Okay. No network, no foreign systems, on my laptop, no database. I should be able to run my tests. I should be able to run my tests on the train, home from work. I should be able to run my tests uh, at work. I should be able to run them at home. I should be able to run the tests anywhere. There will be some configuration issues, of course. I might have to mock out some things that I don't normally mock out, but I should be able to repeat the execution of my tests anywhere, which means that for the most part, you don't want to have any external dependencies, or at least you want to be able to control those external dependencies. The worst situation 